One of the places that I visited was the Darul Aman Palace, bombed out shell of a building, and presented to uh, you know a striking image. So I, I, I went there to take photographs. The temptation was to get closer and closer to get a better angle. So I kind of went off the road and started walking towards this bombed out structure. Suddenly I heard my interpreter shouting at me, uh, saying stop, 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 and I, I stopped and I turned around. And he said, look, don't move, uh, because this patch of land that you're standing on uh, has, been, has not been demined. And that there are land, we know that there are landmines planted there, but it hasn't been demined. And so I said, okay, what, what do I do now? And he says, look, you, you have to come back exactly the way you came. And don't go here and there. And so, so the 10 or 15 seconds it took me to go back to where he was standing uh, were perhaps the most terrifying moment uh, in my reporting life because of all the, of all the ways to go, a landmine <laughs> in bombed out Kabul uh, is perhaps the least pleasant. It's hard to evaluate the extent of the risk, but I felt, I mean, I was under watch uh, and felt threatened uh, during the time that I visited uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Uh, there were these two chaps uh, in civil dress, uh, very obviously ISI, deeply concerned as to who I was and what, what was I doing there and so on and so forth. And they then remained like a shadow for the, for the next day when I was in Skardu. But when I said I'm leaving Skardu to go to Gilgit, uh, they said, OK, but how are you going to go? Uh, we're going to drive you there. I said, no, I'm, I'm going to take a bus. So they put me on a bus and um, essentially instructed the driver to not let me off except at the Gilgit bus station. But uh, drivers being drivers, I guess he forgot the instructions or whatever. It was a chaotic bus journey. So about five kilometers short of Gilgit, when the bus stopped to pick up other passengers, I just, I just slipped out. And uh, for the rest of the trip, I hope, uh, I was uh, outside of their uh, surveillance purview, but one never knows. But, you know, the, 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 the sense of constantly looking over your shoulder, wondering if somebody's tailing you, uh, is, is a pretty unpleasant one for a journalist. Uh, I think the year was 2000 or 2001. A rare time when an Indian reporter was able to visit there. And I took a taxi up from Islamabad. It's, a, it's about an hour and a half's drive. And uh, checked into a hotel and immediately, my standard practice is before anybody gets to know too much about your whereabouts, just leave the hotel. So I went for a, a lengthy walkabout and um, roamed the city, tried to meet as many people based on contact numbers that I had. and. Uh, Later that evening, I met up with a local reporter whose number had been given to me, who said that um, tomorrow I will take you to a training camp of the Lashkar Tayyaba. Now, for me, this was great, uh, a great exclusive, and I said absolutely. Um, he said, I'll, I'll come, I'll come for you in the morning. Be ready at six or seven in the morning. I think eight in the morning. He says, and so I was thrilled, and I thought this is great, and uh, and then I carried on roaming the town, and then went to see a film and had dinner and came back to the hotel, slept. At six in the morning, I got a call from reception saying, Ki, Sir, you come down, someone has come to meet you. So I said, yes, that journalist has come to meet you. I was surprised he came so early. He said, no, he said that you come down immediately. Come down immediately. So I said, what happened to you? He said, no, you come immediately. So I, well, I went down and there was not one guy, there were 20 people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were saying ki aap to Indian journalist hain, kal raat aap kahan the, aap, aap kahan kahan ghume, who all did you meet? So I said, well, I, I met a local reporter. He said, haan, wo to pata hai humko, lekin aur kis se mile. So I said, well, I saw a film. Luckily, I had the ticket stub. So I was able to show the ticket stub. They were deeply suspicious. Why is an Indian coming to uh, Park Occupied Kashmir to see a Pakistani movie? And uh, they said, uh, show us your notebook. I said, I don't have a notebook. And they said, look, in order for you to come here, you have to have an NOC. Where is your NOC? And I said, I don't have an NOC. So they said, well, in that case, uh, you have to leave immediately. Uh, so I said, no, but I have work to do. They said, look, you can either come with us to the police station, where we will then interrogate you as to who all you met, 
uh, and I said, "What's the other option?" He said, "Oh, you go up, get your bags, and we will put you in a in, in a uh, taxi right now." So I said, "Okay, I choose that option." <laughs> so they they literally flagged down a uh, they're called wagons, minivans, uh, and they. Uh, the front seat is always the nicest. They kick the guy out who was in the front, put me there, and they told the driver, "You will drop him off at the Rawalpindi bus station." Um, and and that was it. That was the end of my visit to uh, Muzaffarabad. Never got to meet Lakshmi. I never got to meet. See, I see any Lakshmi at training camp, sadly. <laughs> Undoubtedly, uh, in Delhi you don't see much of that, but even here. Uh, I think the, the unwritten rule that journalists will not be targeted, whether by the police or by protesters, quote unquote, uh, that, that rule seems to have uh, disappeared. Uh, our colleagues in Jammu Kashmir face violence all the time and uh, have uh, suffered serious bodily harm uh, because of uh, you know, attacks by uh, the police or security forces. We see this elsewhere too. But if in Delhi now, journalists are not safe, uh, then this itself tells you the extent to which being a journalist has become a much more dangerous profession. And I would say even globally, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find instances in the, during World War II or the 50s or 60s where journalists covering wars or conflicts uh, were directly targeted. But I'm afraid now, uh, if you're a journalist in a, in a conflict zone, there's a good chance that somebody, one of the combatants may think that, okay, you're fair game. And what happened to Danish in, uh, in Afghanistan, and there are many other examples, uh, you know, is, is proof of the fact that, that it's now uh, a highly risky profession, uh, especially if you're covering conflict uh, and, and armed conflict in particular. Of late now, over the past year, we've seen full-fledged criminal cases being filed against the wires, reporters, and the wire and myself personally for for journalistic work right this is something that hasn't really happened in the past not to us not to other media organizations and we're not the only ones across the board i think there is greater institutional you know intolerance towards journalistic activities we are a victim the indian express others too and uh, i'm afraid uh, freelance reporters who don't have institutional backing Right? They don't have an organization to represent them, are especially, especially vulnerable. Right? We've seen examples in Uttar Pradesh where reporters covering the terrible kind of midday meals that are being served or other, other problems with you know, the administration end up getting you know, pretty serious charges filed against them. And um, you know, so this is a new chapter in the kind of pressure that media in India is subjected to. There is uh, enormous pressure right now, which is why India's ranking in global press freedom indices is, is so pathetic. Uh, I think the fact that governments are so trigger happy legally means that one has to be ultra cautious and careful as to, uh, not that you trim your sails or don't do certain stories, but that you make sure all your ducks are in a row, your facts are all uh, uh, in place and that you've made a, a reasonable effort to get the government's point of view. Uh, all of these are good journalistic practices and one has to ensure that you don't cut corners there. Uh, so that, I think, uh, there's nothing like the threat of these kinds of cases to, to drive home the point to all colleagues that you have to, you can't cut corners there. But at the same time, yeah, the fact that there is this kind of pressure means the stakes are much higher. It also means that a, a significant section of the media uh, is more than likely to back off from doing certain kinds of stories. So that, that is, to my mind, uh, an invitation for us to, uh, to, to, to go where others fear to tread. And I think that um, this is the big challenge facing independent media today, not just us, but other, other portals, other websites, other newspapers that uh, still believe in good old fashioned journalism. You know, I'd much rather that we were not targeted because, uh, you know, no matter how much we, we say that uh, these cases don't bother us, and they don't, but they take up time, they take up energy, editorial energy, 
time that I need to spend on doing stories or reporting or editing gets you know gets consumed when you have to look at legal briefs and affidavits and so on and so forth right so so in an ideal world journalists and publications like ours should not have to deal with this kind of legal harassment uh, if it if it if it's thrown at us we will deal with it and we will emerge uh, smiling but uh, i'd be lying if i said that uh, i have no problem uh, and that you know it's okay uh, it's not okay and uh, it's 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 a waste of my time it's a waste of uh, my colleagues time to have to deal with uh, with harassment and if uh, and, and and the reason they harass us is precisely because they want to divert us away from from doing journalism right so so um, even as we say uh, we're going to carry on but it does impede impede the work that we do which is why they file those cases um you know, you know the story that was difficult and it it still rankles uh because there was never any closure that you know was the the patribal the fake encounter of of uh of patribal in uh, jammu kashmir where the uh, jammu kashmir police and seven rashia rifle uh jawans uh, 7rr essentially killed five innocent civilians and tried to pass them off as terrorists and uh there was a whole struggle villagers said that the bodies must be exhumed and after after a great deal of opposition uh the government finally agreed then the bodies were exhumed dna samples were taken the government tried to fudge the, the dna samples uh i was with the times of india at the time we were able to do a story busting that tampering of dna and ensuring that fresh samples were taken and finally the identity of the five dead civilians was firmly established that they were not terrorists they were in fact civilians now that happened way back in 2002 2003 and uh, it it breaks my heart that 18 years later uh, the uh, policemen and army uh, officers who were who were responsible for that uh, cold blooded murder uh, were never sentenced right so they, they they were never punished so so when you when you work hard and take risks and break a story and when you work with the relatives of victims of uh, say an encounter in this case and they cooperate with you in the hope that you will deliver justice and then you're not able to deliver justice uh, that's upsetting and that stays with you um, it doesn't mean that we stop doing those kinds of stories but uh, every time you work hard and you you reckon you have a watertight case and then the system doesn't deliver uh, i think uh, it 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 uh, it destroys a small part of your uh, you know in a piece and uh, so those stories never go away because uh, justice never gets done and um, i would say that's that's the one story yeah that stays with me